everybody. I'm Alana King. And I'm Tim King. And I'm Lee Borden. So Lee, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Uh, thanks for having me today, Alana and Tim. I'm Lee Borden. I'm teacher librarian at Holy Trinity Elementary School in Torbay, Newfoundland. Uh, that's a community just about five minutes drive outside of St. John's, our capital city. I work in a kindergarten to grade four school, and I've been there for almost 16 years now. I'm also president of Teacher Librarians of Newfoundland and Labrador, our provincial uh, council. And you're also an Angela Thacker award winner. Thank you for reminding everyone. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Tim, what do you tell us about yourself? So I'm a computer technology teacher and I'm currently seconded with ICTC, the Information and Communication Technology Council, uh, which is a very big acronym. And I'm also seconded with the Quantum Algorithms Institute where I'm studying quantum computing. But my day job is as a secondary computer technology teacher. Right. And I'm Alana King, and I'm currently working as an instructional designer and uh, curriculum lead on a project with TVO, and as well as I teach secondary school. So um, the three of us had a really cool experience, and that's what we were hoping that we could talk to you about today, and that Canadian School Libraries Journal was really interested in. And um, if it's all right, I just thought maybe we could just sort of talk about how this idea came together and, and, uh, and took off from there. So Tim, why don't you tell us maybe about your perceived need and then how we matched you up with Lee? So what happened was I was seconded last year and they kept telling us we have K-12 cybersecurity material. And uh, anybody who works in education, know there's no such thing as K-12 to because everything is very distinct and different. Um, I, I don't even think kindergarten stuff would work in grade three, let alone grade six or grade 12. So, um, so I started looking around for something that could fill that gap and maybe we could actually do cyber safety training with, with the littles. So I came across Cyber Legends at a conference um, it's Canadian made startup. Uh, they've done some really interesting things with gamified learning, um, all cloud-based stuff. So you don't need a fancy machine. You can play it on a Chromebook or anything. Um, and it teaches you basic cyber safety. I, I met the people who ran cyber legends and they're on a mission, a personal mission to try and resolve this gap we have. Um, so ICTC has supported them for the last year and a half doing outreach with Cyber Legends so that we can actually provide material for elementary classrooms. So how did we find ourselves in Newfoundland? So <laughs> the other thing I do with uh, ICTC is Cyber Titan, which is how I got into it. I coached it for a number of years um, out here in Ontario. So Cyber Titan is National Student Cybersecurity Competition. We had somebody from Grand Falls, Windsor reach out and say, we'd really like to get into it. We have no idea where to start. Would you like to come out and do a couple of days of, you know, sort of field trippy type stuff with students and just walk them through as they get a feel for it? So so I, I got the trip out to Newfoundland. I was really excited about that. My first time on the island um, and, you know, final province checked. Um, and so I was really excited about that. But then because Cyber Legends was just coming into focus, we just started the partnership. Yeah. Um, I said, well, what, what can we do to try and try some Cyber Legends while we're out there too? And that's where Alana came in. And I said, <laughs> I know someone in Newfoundland and she's really interested in trying new things. And, and, you know, and we approached you, Lee. And of course, being you, you said yes. Can you tell us what that looked like when you said yes? Well, when I said yes, and thank you, I, I love being given uh, things to say yes to that are interesting and exciting and uh, and bring friends from the mainland into my school. Um, I didn't really know much about what Cyber Legends would look like. I did know, however, that our school district has required of us for quite a few years to teach digital citizenship lessons. Um, and these sort of came down from above. They weren't particularly connected to a grade level, as Tim mentioned earlier. And I think that often they felt like an add-on for teachers. People didn't necessarily feel like they were very uh, well integrated in the learning we were already engaged in and not necessarily very meaningful for students. So when uh, Tim and Alana got in touch about uh, Cyber Legends, I was excited to give it a try. Uh, we came up with a day when I could have all of my grade four classes. We figured that would be a, a good age group to start with, with this project. Um, I, I could have them all through the library in that day. And we had an, 
an, an incredibly exciting morning, despite the miserable weather that we had outside that day. And in fact, for the whole week that you were here. Well, you know, I mean, it's really interesting, right? Like the demographic of your school is K to four specifically, right? How many students is that all together? About 500. And so when we had five back to back four grade four classes, did we have all of the grade fours? We saw everybody that morning. Isn't that like, I just think like we couldn't have arranged a more perfect way to sort of like establish that baseline. It was really amazing. And I thought it, was- it worked out really well uh, in that we got to a chance to see not only how the different groups of children, um, mm-hmm. the English classes and the French immersion classes uh, interacted, but also how our technology held up to the program as the morning went on. In my school, typically, um, we find that the Wi-Fi works considerably better before recess than it does sort of after lunch. Right. And, uh, and that was something we took note of uh, in the program that day. Yeah, it was really interesting. Was there anything that you had to do in terms of the teachers or the students or the admin to prepare them for the arrival of that day? Not really. I did uh, visit all of the classes ahead of time and set up their class profiles, their individual accounts in Cyber Legends. Um, And I had introduced them in a very, very brief way to what they would encounter in the program. Uh, Mostly, I wanted to cut down on any delay in the signing in process, because sometimes Mm -hmm. when kids are signing into a new program, it can take them a lot of time if they've got a new username or password to deal with. So I wanted to make sure that I had front loaded that a little bit because we only had a half hour with each group. Um, and if we had if we had, had more time, an, an hour would have been perfect, I think. Uh, beyond that, it was not heavy lifting for me in terms of preparing the students for it. And uh, they dove right in, as you can recall. They loved it. That's it. I know we're going to include some great pictures. I know with our uh, our article for CSL, so I think uh, it'll be really neat to see that all come together. But um, just before we go forward with that, Tim, what did you do to prepare for this day? My big worry was that we're it's basically experimental technology, so uh, we're we're trying a, a gamified experience. It's quite a lot of bandwidth. Um, once it sets up, it's okay, but initially there's a lot of bandwidth. So it is kind of like a test for your network. Um, I, I really didn't know what your connection speeds would be like, but um, I think once we had the initial sort of kinks worked out, and some of them were very strange, like uh, the, the older Chromebooks worked, but the middle generation didn't, and the newer ones did. And you're just all of these little details that maybe the people who were designing the game didn't even think of either. And, and why would they? Like, But th- this is the world educators live in. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you've got old tech, you've got middle tech, you've got new tech. You're trying to make it all work. You probably should have had a lot of it replaced, but you've got to work with what you've got. Um, and so for me, I'm always somebody who can get something working when it shouldn't. So for me, I'm, I'm comfortable with that, but I was in a completely unfamiliar environment. So I was really worried it would just not work at all. (laughs) But at the same time, I noticed a lot of things that were in your library learning commons, Lee, that you had prearranged maybe because of other experiences, um, because you designed your space, right? Yeah. Yeah, And and to, to a large extent, yes. So one of the things that I noticed right away was that you had sort of a presentation area so that we could do a sort of a show and share over there. And then you had a move away space where kids could actually get their own device and find their own space to sit down. And there were, um, the other thing I noticed is that there were hot spots in the room where the Wi-Fi was working better than others. Interesting, right? But how do you facilitate or how do you facilitate from the beginning of the year? This is going to be our structure. When we need a Chromebook, we're going to do this. Like, how do you set that all up with the students? Well, we start very young with our students. We start with them in at least grade one and sometimes in kindergarten. Um, oh, we've got a little visitor here, my puppy Cleo. <laughs> She's here to say hi. Um <laughs> We start with uh, definitely with grade one, sometimes with kindergartners, getting them accustomed to using their Chromebooks. And if you've done any Chromebook work with littles, you know that it's a lot of work to establish. But we were early adopters at our school. We've had Chromebooks in the building since I believe 2016. And uh, over time, we've established a a routine of working with old keyboards that we have the uh, um, 
the chords cut off, for example, singing the alphabet song, typing out the alphabet on the old keyboard boards, noticing that they're not in alphabetical order, finding the letters of our name on the keyboards and so on before we ever go near the Chromebooks. But as you might remember, I had a giant Chromebook keyboard in the library as well, which we use with a pointer for pointing out all those tricky bits like the underscore in every one of our students' uh, email accounts. They have an underscore, which is a very strange object that nobody understands. We also um, did a, a sort of contrived system of color coding on our Chromebooks. And we used the Cricut machine in our library um, and made color coded dots out of permanent vinyl, which we've stuck on all of the um, 50 or so Chromebooks that are in our school uh, so that children know that if you need to make uh, an underscore, you press on the big yellow dot on the shift key and then touch one time on the little yellow dot on the underscore key. And this color coding system has really helped us. So by the time you get to grade four, there really aren't that many children who need assistance, for example, in signing into their Chromebooks. They've got that pretty down pat. Um, mostly what they need reminders about is how to use the technology uh, safely and appropriately and um, the right places and times for that. It, it was incredible. And I remember, Tim, you had a really strong reaction to these innovative keyboard modifications that she'd made. Do you remember what you said at that time? It just drives me crazy that you see all these big multinationals saying Chromebooks for education. And then you look at the Chromebook and it looks exactly the same as the Chromebook in Best Buy. And I, I'm like, how is this for education? And you look at what Lee did, which was some, you know, crafty vinyl stickers. Uh, why aren't all of our Chromebooks for education color-coded keyboards? Well, why isn't that just a natural thing? Like it was hugely logical for us. And I have to say that my colleague, Kim Keating, and I uh, came up with this plan together. We decided to try it with the Cricut vinyl after a few uh, other discussions about other stickers that we might use. But the Cricut vinyl has proved quite invincible. We have hardly had to replace a single color-coded dot. Um, and it has been worth it for us. So as a matter of fact, through a number of different presentations that um, my colleague Kim and I have done uh, here in Newfoundland, we have other schools in our school district who are adopting uh, the same kind of process with their Chromebooks in their schools in order to make it easier for their little ones to um, get engaged with uh, Google Apps earlier on. It's really interesting. And so here's the other thing that I did. Now, I'm a secondary literacy English specialist. And so the first thing I noticed, you know, and this is the secondary point of view, was how much those students in grade four were relying on the audio version of what was being told because it was so text based. And I hadn't even considered it. But another thing that you had ready in your learning comments was a pair of headphones for every kid who would need them. Amazing. <laughs> We encourage all the students to come to school um, with headphones from the beginning of the school year. Uh, I have a set of about 40 in the library uh, for anyone who needs them. And I did buy them with microphones uh, oh, yeah. because I wanted to make sure that we could maximize voice to text opportunities for students. Um, but I also have a uh, little giveaway earbuds. If I'm on an airplane, I take all the ones that nobody else takes and I put them in my pockets. And when a kid shows up at the library, without their own earbuds, I give them a set and I write their name on them. And these are yours, don't lose them. Um, it's really handy to have that because you're right, they do rely more than perhaps they would have before the pandemic on uh, audio. Um, because I think that sometimes reading skills are difficult. Um, reading skills that are when the text is unusual or unfamiliar, it's certainly more difficult for them uh, to read it than to listen to it. And so I like that uh, Cyber Legends both had the audio and the, uh, the text version available. I like the fact that if everybody grabs headphones, whether they do or not, it normalizes it. And there wasn't anyone who felt like my reading ability is going to be preventing me from playing this game. And I think that like that equity piece is really important. I was really impressed by that. Well, thank well, the you. Bits and I, 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 you've I, got to put together though. Like that, it's incredible. It, it worked as well as it did because you had a well running machine there. Like the, the kids had been had been trained on what they needed to do. The expectations were clear. You'd done all sorts of additional adaptation to your technology. It was a real joy to see. 
Uh, thank you so much. It was certainly a pleasure. It was a, it was a busy morning and I was probably a bit tired by the end of it, but I felt really good about it. And I think that the feedback we got from the children was really interesting too. Um, and the fact that we were able to, uh, with one class in particular, follow up several times uh, with the creators was really, really neat for them. They felt like they were extremely important uh, beta testers for this for this game. Well, and they were. Tim, did you get any feedback? Yeah, the team of Cyber Legends were just overjoyed. The, the chief software engineer on the program was just thrilled to be talking to the kids. He could not get back to it soon enough. And that happened multiple times, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, yeah, really positive. It's a, it's a really, really, really interesting idea. And you know, since that experience, when I'm watching parents and children out in public and, you know, whether we're in trains or in waiting rooms or whatever, and they're using their device. And I see that moment when they need to, they want to hear the sound, but that barrier without headphones, it, it, it creates extra noise for everybody else, you know, which can be annoying and also maybe unmanageable in terms of like trying to keep a space appropriate for multiple types of learning in one place, but also you know, it's a disadvantage because they're suddenly, they're, they're hampered. They can't go ahead with the activity that they were planning. Um, the other piece that I was thinking about was the feedback from maybe the teachers. Did you get any feedback about anything that had changed or any ripples that had come out of that experience? Yes, we had several. I mean, the teachers were all really excited to have had the opportunity to come and do something as interesting and unusual as this. You know, it's not the kind of thing that happens every day in our schools in St. John's, you know. Um, so first of all, they were really excited just to have had the opportunity to have had two teachers from Ontario visiting our school and teaching with them was a real pleasure for them. Uh, one teacher in particular was quite a, quite a, a techie teacher. She was um, very young, one of our French immersion teachers at the time. And and she got really into uh, identifying the sort of glitchy bits and so on with the kids. And she uh, she and they came back to uh, Cyber Legends quite a few times and made lists of the concerns that they had and sent them forward to the team at Cyber Legends. So she was really excited about that side of it as well, uh, which I think was probably beyond some of the other teachers. But for her, it really fit into her uh, interests. It was a real, that's a really nice way to sort of pull in the the power of the student voice too to say this is what we're we're noticing and this is what we think needs adjusting or changing. Yeah, I think so too. I think that made them feel uh, so much more engaged in the in this particular uh, game than they would otherwise have been. So on that day, Tim, what did you observe that you thought automatically these are things that that I would recommend be changed? Like, what was your point of view on that? I think one of the, for me, it's the immersion piece. If you can get the kids immersed in the game quickly, uh, they're all going to play it their own way. So I love the differentiation inherently you get in gameplay. Um, but when there's that barrier to entry, I think one of my favorite pictures is one of the kids is waiting for the bar to fill. So he's turned the laptop sideways and he's shaking it <laughs> to try and get the bar to go faster. Um, I love that moment. But for me, once we got them in the game, uh, and they were all really, really keen to get into the game. Once they were in it, they were in it. Um, mm -hmm. And people were, you know, like they, it was down the rabbit hole and they were gone. Um, when when we were having some of the technical issues with that one generation of Chromebook, um, the, the one little guy who went and stood on the milk crates and started playing on the projector, just because I need to get into this. Everyone else is going to be talking about this at recess. And I've, you know, I can't wait. I, I, can't, right? I can't miss this. So he went out of his way to make it happen. You know, uh, when you see students grabbing opportunities like that, that that's really thrilling for me. So that, that was those were two of the takeaways for me. And, and in terms of the actual um, lessons of cybersecurity or, you know, how it fits into, in a sense, a continuum of what we're trying to achieve as as teachers in the year of 2023 and, and helping our students feel digitally ready and, and, you know, I guess, uh, flexible, adaptable for whatever those changes are that are to come. Was there anything that you noticed, Lee, that you thought this is, this is a, a different way to t approach this, or this is some learning happening here? Well, I think for me, the most important difference was that the students were really, uh, captivated by it. They felt engaged by it. I think, um, 
in my experience, often the the lessons that we have been provided with um, around digital citizenship or cybersecurity have not felt particularly meaningful to students. They sound like something teacher says, uh, the internet is dangerous and you should stay away from it or something like that. When in fact, um, this opportunity through Cyber Legends uh, gave the kids a chance to feel like as though it was something that they belonged to and it belonged to them. It's really neat. And there was one um, there was one moment that I think repeated definitely in the last two or three of the classes because we've gotten further along through it. But basically, the game starts with sort of an orientation, how you move on the keyboard. Remember, it was those like uh, ASD skills with the left hand instead Wazdy. of the arrow key. It's mm. ASD, right? Wazdy. Wazdy. Thank mm. you. And then the other yeah, piece was... Um, then they can start to personalize. And so I know that they spent some time in there going, oh, like, this is how I want my 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 person to look or my, you know, my avatar or whatever to do. But the very first digital literacy task that they had to do was to make a pizza. Do you remember this piece? Mm-hmm. And they had to choose a number of things they could put on it, but they were like normal pizza items and also ridiculous pizza items. So like a lot of kids would be like, oh, I'm going to choose like puppies, fire trucks and pepperoni, and that'll be my pizza. But then the task after that, and I'm going to say like, it, it felt like about five minutes, so I'm not sure how much gameplay it actually was, was to recall their pizza toppings and use that as a password to enter the next thing. And I think what it's trying to teach them is that a multi-phrase password is stronger than mm-hmm. another one, right? And almost, I would say almost 70% of the kids, maybe even more than that, went up to the teacher and said, I don't remember my password. What is it? And that's when I went, oh, because, and this is something I don't know that we've had a conversation about, Lee, is that we repeated the same exercise with Cyber Legends in a public library situation. So these students or these kids were ages grade six to to 11. 11, And they came by choice. So they were like, oh, cybersecurity. Yeah, I'm totally interested in. And Tim interrupted them with Cyber Legends and said, get into this. And at that task, all the youngest students had the same problem, mm-hmm. but the older students immediately took a picture of their pizza and said, I know I'm going to need to remember that. Like they had clued in somehow to like, that's going to be a thing that's coming up. Oh, and cool. I was thinking that's a huge literacy piece. Very interesting. I, I'm I'm intrigued by that. That's really, uh, I would have liked to have seen that. That's super cool. I also wonder, um, Something that we didn't do with uh, with Cyber Legends when we tried it at my school, um, but that, that I would be interested in pursuing is to do some more pre-teaching. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sort of hesitant. On the one hand, I like the idea of just dropping them in and seeing what they sort of figure out. But on the other hand, there are these extended lesson plans provided in the teacher site for Cyber Legends. In fact, more than, I mean, there's just a ton of stuff there. It would be interesting to uh, to try it both ways and see what the kids prefer and what they get out of it in both cases. The right. good news is that, that based on your feedback, I think primarily from your school, they've done exactly that. So starting in the new year, they're going to have game clips you can play. Okay. So when you're doing the password lesson, you could just play the password section of the game, like Perfect. an in and out kind of thing. So oh, like a targeted kind of, you know, this is going to be about passwords. This is going to be about online privacy. This is going to be. And so you can, the gameplay, instead of it being this giant thing that you can get lost in, which is cool for other reasons, um, is it could be something very lesson specific. It would be neat if we could do some sort of like pre-diagnostic to see what do you know, play the game or play it through a certain number of modules and then say, has that improved or has that changed at all? I'm wondering what really kind of observational data we can get, right? Would you use that, do you think, Lee? Well, I think you'd use it to target your lesson planning at, at the very least. If you had if you had some information, oh, the kids know a lot about making passwords, but they make really poor choices about who to talk to online, for example, uh, then you could at least uh, strategically select the lessons and game clips, like Tim's saying, that you were going to focus on. So, Tim, your ICTC has a sort of a, a digital fluency, digital literacy continuum called FIT, right? Is it something that you can see Cyber Legends fitting into? Yeah, like I said, initially the idea was to try and create a, a full curriculum. 
like a K to 12 curriculum and cyber legends was the piece there, how, how they all fit together. And we're still working out, but I think if we were smart about all of these, and there are a lot of programs in Canada that are trying to address cyber safety, but if we just got everybody together and actually developed an interlocking curriculum of tools that everyone knew was safe and Canadian made and Canadian data storage and everything else. So it it met everyone's criteria. Everybody could just dive into that pool of resources, knowing that it's credible, good stuff from, you Mm -hmm. know, partners who want to help and then, and then work their way forward. So. But one of the other things that we've found this year is that provincially everybody has their own set of standards. Does Newfoundland have its own set of standards for digital citizenship or fluency or something like that? No, we don't. Um, there is no, there are no curriculum outcomes for uh, techn- even technology education for K to six. It starts to pick up in seven, um, but it's a very small percentage of our program of studies overall. And there is not, uh, as I said, like a continuum or a skills set that we're meant to be teaching. The uh, the approach that's been taken in the past has been kind of piecemeal. Um, and to be perfectly honest, we haven't seen much come forward in the last year or two on it anyway. So I guess my, my hard question for you then, Leah, is like, how do you take your direction with knowing like, what should they know? That's a really tricky question. And I would say it applies not only to what they should know having to do with digital uh, citizenship, but what they should know in the digital realm altogether. What skills should they have in Google Slides when they're in grade two, for example? I have an idea in my head and sort of a list of things that I try to uh, teach to my children in my school. But something that's come to me and quite heavily in the last couple of weeks is that not every school in my school district has the same access to the same sorts of technology, to the same bandwidth uh, that I have. And Mm -hmm. so what I'm doing with grade ones in my school is not even remotely possible for grade ones in some rural and remote schools where um, the Wi-Fi may be terrible and the device is limited, if any. So I'm, I'm I'm feeling a lot of sort of pressure around the equity side of things right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so not only am I concerned about students' access to uh, quality cybersecurity education, quality digital, liter- digital literacy, I'm concerned about their access period to digital technology. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I guess during the sort of latter phases of the pandemic, um, I was very interested in... Um, a resolution that was passed at the United Nations about access to digital materials and spent some time writing a letter uh, on behalf of our provincial teacher librarians organization pointing out that this is something that the United Nations says that all of our children um, in school throughout the, the, the world ought to have access to. And uh, we're not doing a great job of it in Canada, unfortunately. And um, even within our city here, I can see that there are vast inequities from one uh, community to another, from one school to another. Yeah, that's really true. I, I always assumed that the policy and the curriculum design was slow just because people were, I don't want to say lazy, but... Just that they did, just didn't care. They, they were like, well, it really doesn't matter, you know, and put it aside. Now I'm starting to wonder if there's a lack of curriculum because it would force people to look at that digital divide and say, how can we teach this at one school when the school 20 miles up the road doesn't have reliable internet access? Mm-hmm. You would need to fix that first. Well, mm-hmm. we can't fix that. We, we don't I, have anything that's not a, I don't think that's a Newfoundland and Labrador problem. I'm sure no, that's a problem no, in many, problem many here. parts of Canada um, and many parts of even in big cities. I know I, I used to teach in Toronto and I know that my school, which was an inner city school, definitely had less access to resources than one in Leaside did. Um, but it, it's it's a difficult question because it's one that people don't very much want to address. And uh, it's a it's a concern that we have here. We're in um, 2021. Our grade seven to 12 students were all given one to one Chromebooks. Mm. T- terrific, except there doesn't appear to be a plan in place for the uh, systematic replacement of those devices. And we are concerned that in 2027 there's going to be what we're referring to as a tech apocalypse um, when there are 
uh, 60,000, 50,000 Chromebooks out there, not a one that works and none to replace them. Yeah, I mean, and that doesn't include even the quantum computing stuff that's coming down the pipe. So I, in my high school, one of the things we do is we do the IT support locally, like because I'm teaching IT. So, uh, so the students kind of run our own help desk. So what happened a few years ago, just as we were getting into Chromebooks, probably about the same time you were, um, you know, a few years in, there's piles of dead Chromebooks everywhere. Mm -hmm. Students have intentionally broken them or whatever. And screens were a real problem on the early ones we had. They were really bendy oh, so yeah. that they would snap really easily. Um, so I looked up a replacement and said, can I replace this? And our school board IT department said, no, 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 that's our job. You have to give it to us. So we, we sent it down to them and they charged $250 to repair a three-year-old, what was a $299 Chromebook, um, which made no sense at all. So they said, well, we're not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I go looking up and I, I find an aftermarket screen replacement for $30. So my students, because we don't charge anything for the work, could repair the Chromebooks for 30 bucks each. So for a long time, my school was the only one with excess Chromebooks because we kept the old ones going. And we, we started Frankensteining them, too. We would bring in like partially broken ones, dismantle them and use the spare parts to make other ones work. But it was great experience for the students. So there are solutions to this, but no one's that flexible. And when you're dealing with, you know, adults, with a contract who <laughs> want to charge what they want to charge for the work, then again, it backs us into a corner. One of the interesting takeaways I had from that day is I think that um, one of your IT technicians came on site or came into the library learning commons. Mm. And her comments were about how much they were beta testing the network and how there were all sorts of things that were happening that day that were informative for her. Uh, was there anybody else that you think was like, like had key observations about it? Well, Kim, my colleague who came in that day, she actually is a teacher on staff who happens to be the teacher on staff who's most engaged with uh, the sort of technical side of technology. She's the person you talk to if something needs fixing. Um, she and I talked afterwards to our district technician who comes to repair things. And we were explaining to him the various, uh, various things we'd seen, for example, that middle generation of Chromebooks that really resisted running the program. And he was really surprised, of course, but he, he carried that forward to his superiors in the IT department of the school district. Um, just as a point of interest, we did afterwards add another uh, Wi-Fi router in the library, and that seems to have helped a little bit with some of our afternoon problems. Great. Good. That's so good to hear. Was there anything else that changed? Like, do you think that um, Cyber Legends or something like this kind of learning will become part of the grade four practice? I think so. I have uh, I have just been in touch with Tim fairly recently, in fact, about um, setting up accounts for my current grade fours. And now that we've talked today with the new uh, rollout after Christmas of the bite-sized uh, games, I think I'm going to introduce, I'll wait and I'll introduce it to them just after Christmas in the new year. I like the idea of them being able to use it possibly uh, in one of their rotations in their centers in their classroom. Um, so that they don't necessarily all 24 of them have to come to the library at the same time, but five or six of them could be working on Cyber Legends as one of the rotations in their learning blocks in their classroom as the day goes on. And I think that would probably be a, um, a more integrated way of them approaching uh, Cyber Legends rather than sort of as a one-off or something special you have to come to the library for. This is just one of our things that we're doing. We're playing this game for a bit. We're learning these skills and uh, and then moving on to the next thing. And Tim, for you, did working with Lee and her grade fours change the goals that you had in mind or change how you proceeded for the rest of the year in terms of what you wanted to accomplish? I think I think what it did is a proof proof of concept. I, I think it is the, the right tool for the job. Um, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, many of us don't have the other tools for the job that we need. So that that seems to be an ongoing problem. But I, I think as, as a solution, I think there's a lot to it. I love that they're breaking it into pieces and changing the delivery method. So it, I, there's a value to the game. I mean, if kids want to go home and just play the game, it's going to embed some really good habits in them that, that could 
end up saving you a lot of pain and frustration as you grow up, you know, which is really the point. Um, but um, I, I don't know. What I've enjoyed about this conversation is how wide ranging it's been and, and how it really shows how uneven this landscape is. Um, there's the William Gibson quote all over again, right? The future is already here, but it's unevenly distributed. Uh, that's especially true in education. <laughs> so, you know, it, and and in a lot of cases, the, the schools we see do really well in technical competition are specialist STEM urban schools with every benefit and advantage. They're well on the right side of the digital divide. So for those of us who are still struggling to get over that wall, uh, you know, it's it's a battle. And, you know, for Lee, you're, you're obviously pivotal in your school as the teacher librarian in your district, in your province, nationwide now. Uh, is there anything that you will take away from this that you think, this is my new reason to get up in the morning? Like, is there some way that you're going to say, I need to make this happen in those earlier grades? Is there something that you want to do for, uh, what are the other things that you feel like, like you're planning? Well, um, my professional learning journey this year, um, this is uh, our plan that we make each year for our professional goals for the year ahead, uh, has to do with technology in kindergarten to grade two in particular. I feel like we're doing a really great job in grades three and four at our school. Um, my children can access Book Creator, they can make websites, they're comfortable in Google Slides. They can... So I feel like I'm doing a good job on that side of things, but I wanted to bring it back and make sure that the skills that we're developing are helping the children get to a point where um, they don't need to think about their skill development anymore. The skills are ingrained and then they can get on with deep learning um, in whatever capacity it is that we want to go to. Um, so that's that's really been my focus. And I think using programs and games like Cyber Legends gives us a chance to uh, build in those uh, safety and security skills they need, again, without having to spend a ton of time doing a typing tutor or something like that. Um, it's built in. It's fun. It, it gets the lesson to the to the kids so that we can get on with the next big thing. And that's my goal is to get to more big things using technology um, so that the kids are, are um, engaged more fully in their educational experience. Does that give you the hope that you needed, Tim King? Yeah, it does. And, and I mean, I was thinking about it today and I thought this does help you actually learn better, too. So yeah. if you're handy with the technology and you know how to get going quickly on it, It'll speed up every aspect of your educational journey, and and then ideally, when you graduate, it'll put you out into the world in a in a place where you understand how it works and you can participate. Uh, the last thing we want to do is graduate anyone with such poor digital skills that they're unemployable. Like that's not. That's my hope. If I can teach my grade ones to sign into their Chromebooks efficiently, uh, then when they're in grade seven, they don't need to worry about that. Then they can dive right into uh, a coding project or writing a book online or any number of other incredible projects that if they have to learn the basic skills of where letters are on the keyboard, um, they're going to be far, far behind with. And and I think that this is a serious part of the digital divide. It's, it's an equity piece that we're seeing here in our school system. Um, but I suppose what I need to do uh, in my position is continue to uh, do what I can with the kids that I have and also advocate for the rest of the children in our province. And please let us know how it goes, because I would love to hear how the middle schools handle your kids when they come in and they've got the advanced skills that they weren't expecting. Um, it'll be really interesting to see that. Tim, uh, but if people want to get involved in Cyber Legends, are there opportunities still available to them now? Yeah, so with, wow, that was a big ding ding. <laughs> uh, um, we're still operational at ICTC until the end of March. That's when our CAN code funding ends. But um, I would still be more than happy to provide a site license for anybody who wants to try Cyber Legends. Just uh, look up ICTC and eTalent Canada, and you'll be able to find us on there and get in touch and and would, would happily provide you with your first year experience with it. And you can test it and see if it fits the need. And then if it does, hopefully we can keep Cyber Legends going. Uh, that they, they are a small Canadian startup. The, this is not some big corporate monster. The, this is like a family making this thing work. So I want to help. I think that's perfect. I and mean, I think that's a great place to leave it, unless either of you have any more takeaways or wrap ups. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. It was a pleasure to have you at my school in April. And it's a pleasure to be back with you right now.
I hope we can come back again. Wouldn't that be great? More than welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Lee, for your time. Of course.